Hi everyone, welcome to the run through video for the Chem 5 paper from June 2014. Um, so, if there's a lot of writing for the answer, I probably won't write it in because it would take me a lot longer. Um, but if there's working out or equations, I will write them in. So, first question says, write an equation with the process that has an enthalpy change equal to the electron affinity of chlorine. So the electron affinity is where... So to get the two marks, first you've got to talk about that attraction. So you have to say there's an attraction between the electron and the nucleus of the chlorine atom. You've got to say the nucleus. You can't just say the chlorine atom because overall that is neutral. Then it's the nucleus that is positively charged. That's the first mark. And the second mark set for saying, therefore, energy is released when the electron is gained. And that's just talking about that negative value there. Next question, complete the Born-Harbor cycle. So um, first thing is... Uh, you've got to have half F2 here. So remember, this is your formation enthalpy. And then the next step... Oh, sorry, you have to also have that as a, put your state symbols in. Next step is also half F2, because the only change that's been made is the atomization of the silver. Remember, to, you have to do one step at a time. Next step is um, half F2, and because the silver is now charged the electrons come off, and then finally, obviously that's big gas again, sorry, and then finally you've got F, which is a gas, plus an electron, and then that electron is, is added to the, the fluorine in that step there. It says, use a cycle in question 1C, 1, and the data in table 1 to calculate a value in kilojoules per mole for the bond enthalpy of the fluorine-fluorine bond. Now the bond enthalpy for the fluorine fluorine bond is actually the last step where your half F2 turns into just F. So you're working out that, that top arrow. Um, so you need to just put the arrows, put the numbers onto the arrows and then work out that arrow that is left over. So you're going to have this X plus 732 plus 289. And that's half x, sorry, plus 203 equals 348 plus 955. Rearrange, you just want half x and get all the numbers on one side. Half x equals 79 and therefore x equals 158 double 79. So that's your answer. Next question, a theoretical value for enthalpy of lattice association can be calculated using a perfect ionic model. The theoretical enthalpy of lattice association for silver fluoride is plus 870. Explain why the theoretical enthalpy of lattice association for silver fluoride is different for experimental value. And this is all about the perfect ionic model. Always we will be in talking about covalent character. So you get the two marks here for just saying that AGF has some covalent character. And because AGF is not perfectly ionic, there's your two marks. Obviously, there's ways of saying this in different ways. So for the second point, you could say that AGF are not point charges or they're not perfect spheres. Um, it doesn't follow the perfect ionic model, any of those that kind of are synonymous with that answer. Next question, the theoretical enthalpy of lattice association with silver chloride is at 770. Explain why this value is less than the value for silver fluoride. And the fact that that's less suggests that the attraction between the chloride ion and the silver ion is weaker. And that'll get you one mark. So the attraction between the silver ion and the chloride ion is weaker. And that's because the chloride ion is larger. So the two ions can't get as close together. So chloride ion is larger than the fluoride ion. And therefore the attraction between the silver ion and the chloride ion is weaker. There are two marks. 
So our first question here is to find the term enthalpy of hydration of an ion. So that's just where um, one mole of gaseous ions, as your first mark, turns into a mole of aqueous ions. Then use data from the table to calculate the value of the enthalpy of hydration of the chloride ion. Now what we can do is use this equation um, to work it out because we have all the values we need and what we're going to put down here in this test cycle is solid silver chloride so so what we've got on this arrow here is minus 464 because that is your enthalpy of hydration of the silver going to make that but then you've also got this hydration so you're going to have plus x that's what we're trying to work out this goes up here, and the arrow that is uh, equal to that is this one, plus 905. And then arrow goes up here, and that's going to be plus 77. Now this clearly is the arrow we need to swap round. So that swaps round. We make this a negative, and then we need to work it out. So this should all, these two should add up to this one. So we're going to have minus 464 plus x equals minus 905 plus 77. So therefore x equals minus 364. That was quite a tricky Hess cycle actually. Um, but hopefully you can see the theory behind how it works. So just why the hydration of the chloride ion is an exothermic process. So whenever they ask whether something's exothermic, why something's exothermic or anything, you've got to talk about why there's an attraction or a repulsion. So you've got to say where the attraction is between. So the attraction is between the chloride ion and the water. So the first mark is saying there's an attraction between the chloride ion and the water, and then say why, and that's because the water is polar, or the water has dipoles. So there's an attraction between the chloride ion and the water because the water is polar. Those are your two marks. Silver chloride is insoluble in water at room temperature. Use data from table 2 to calculate the temperature at which the dissolving of silver chloride in water becomes feasible. Comment on the significance of this temperature value. So, we're trying to work out the temperature at which this becomes feasible. So, dissolving of silver chloride in water. So, AgCl solid turning into Ag aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. So, that's actually plus, sorry. So we're going to do a delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Now, for it to become feasible, then that has to equal zero. So zero equals delta H minus T delta S. Therefore, T will equal uh, delta H over delta S. Now that equals 77, which is our delta H value, divided by, they've got to divide the 33, the entropy value, by 1,000, because we need our two units to be in the same units. Uh, so that equals 2,333 Kelvin. So there's your answer to that one. And the significance of that temperature value is that it's way above the boiling point of water. And so when it, if we got to that value for the silver, to, silver chloride to dissolve, then all the water will have evaporated anyway. So that's the significance. It's way above the temperature that water boils at. When silver fluoride dissolves in water at 25 degrees, the free energy change is minus 9. Use this information and data from table 2 to calculate a value with units for the entropy change when silver fluoride dissolves in water at 25 degrees. So, again, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So it tells you free energy change at the top here. That's going to equal minus 15... <coughs> Minus, says uh, 25 degrees, but that's being Kelvin, so 298 times delta S. So that's going to be equal to minus 9 plus 15 over minus 298, and that equals delta S. So that equals minus 0 0.020, and that's in kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. If you want it in joules per Kelvin mole, you need to times that by a thousand. 
So next question, this question is about some period three elements and their oxides. Describe what you would observe when, in the absence of air, magnesium is heated strongly with water vapour at temperatures above 373 Kelvin and write an equation of the action that occurs. So let's first write the equation. So in the absence of air, magnesium is heated strongly with water vapour. So that's Mg plus H2O. And with steam, remember, you make magnesium oxide and hydrogen, like so. And then what would you observe? Well, this magnesium oxide is a white powder. So there's your first observation. And what else would you see? You'd see a white flame or a bright flame. Explain why magnesium has a higher melting point than sodium. This is going back to Chem 1 for the explanation here. So it's the idea that magnesium has a higher ionic charge because it's 2 plus rather than 1 plus. It has more delocalized electrons in the metal and therefore there's a greater attraction between the delocalized electrons and the ions. Say the structure of unbonding in silicon dioxide. So structure is a giant covalent or macromolecular. And that has the same structure as diamond. The bonding is covalent bonding. And then it says other than its high melting point. A couple of you put high melting point and high boiling point. You can't put high boiling point. That's the same as saying high melting point. So you can say it's hard and can you say it's a non-conductor, or it doesn't conduct. You could also say it's brittle as well, and it's, and it's insoluble, so it doesn't dissolve in water. Give the formula of the species in a sample of solid phosphorus 5 oxide, and state the structure of and describe fully the bonding in this oxide. So the formula is P4O10, and the structure is um, molecular, or simple molecular. So this goes around in just molecules. The bonding is covalent between atoms. So what holds the P and P's and O's together there? It's uh, covalent bonds. But there's van der Waals forces between molecules. So what do you actually have to break to boil or melt this van der Waals forces? Sulfur 4 oxide reacts with water to form a solution containing ions. Write an equation for this reaction. So sulfur 4 oxide is SO2 reacting with water and you've got to make something containing iron so you've got H plus plus HSO3 minus then write an equation for reaction between the acidic oxide phosphorus 5 oxide and the basic oxide magnesium oxide so you've got P4O10 plus magnesium oxide which is MgO and you're going to make Magnesium phosphate, which is Mg3, because magnesium has a 2 plus charge, and phosphate has a 3 plus charge. So you just need two phosphates, like so. And then to balance that, we need two of these and six of these, and that is balanced. Consider the following reaction scheme that starts from the hexarac ion. So there we are. For each of the reactions 1 to 4, identify a suitable reagent and give the formula of the copper-containing species. So reaction 1 is here. So to a pale blue precipitate, that you just need um, either NH3, a little bit of NH3, or OH-. So the reagent, sorry, would be NaOH, because you need to make sure I have a bottle of it. Copper-containing species, well, what you've made there is copper hydroxide, so it's CuOH2, but also H2O4. And the equation is you're going to have the hexarac ion to start with, so 2 plus, plus let's say OH minus, and that makes your copper containing species, you need 2 OH minuses and each one of those takes a hydrogen from the waters here to form the OH on the copper. Then the next one, reagent 2, so that's here, adding this pale blue precipitate, which is this, to form a deep blue solution. So that is your excess NH3. And this is one of your exceptions you have to learn, so it's NH3, 4, H2O, 2, 2 plus, and here we're starting with what we made at the end there, so the copper hydroxide. 
no charge on that, plus NH3, you need four of them to kick out, um, to add the four ammonias there, and then you're going to make their CU, the copper containing compound it just said is made, so I'm just going to zoom out a little bit, and that's two plus, plus H2O and plus OH minus, and we're going to make two OH minuses and two H2Os. Next one, copper containing species for this. So we've got reaction three, which makes a green-blue precipitate. So this is your copper carbonate that you're making, so you need to add carbonate ions, ideally in the form of sodium carbonate. Copper containing species is CuCO3, and you're starting with your hexaracrine. ion. So CuH2O6, two plus, plus your carbonate, and that makes your copper carbonate and six waters. Remember your carbonate ion has a two minus charge. And then finally, your reagent here is either HCl or NaCl, but HCl is best, so conch HCl. What you've made is CuCl4, two minus, and then your equation is the hexaracrine plus 4Cl minus, that's how many you're going to be adding, makes your CuCl4 2 minus plus 6H2O. The reason why this is a 2 minus charge is because each of these Cl's has a minus charge and the copper there is 2 plus. Next question, table 3 shows some standard electropotential data. There it is, give the conventional representation of the cell that is used to measure the standard electropotential of iron as shown in table 3. Um, so, you've got to have the hydrogen electrode attach the iron electrode. That's how you're going to measure the standard electrode potential of the iron. So, you're going to have platinum attached to your, um, so your hydrogen gas being pumped onto that. Then you've got your H+, your salt bridge connects your H+, to your um, to your Fe2 plus solution, and then you've got iron on the outside acting as your um, electrode for that. Next question with reference to the electrons, give the meaning of the term of reducing agent. So the reducing agent is being oxidized itself, so that means it's losing electrons, but it's giving the electrons. If it's acting as an agent, then it's giving the electrons the other thing. So this is an electron donor. So the next question is to identify the weakest reducing agent for the species in table 3 and explain how you deduced your answer. So, weakest reducing agent is the one that's going to be worst at losing electrons. So the one that's worst at losing electrons is going to be the, um, the most positive one because that's not going to be giving electrons away to the ones that are negative. Um, so the most positive one is the one that's the worst at losing electrons and the one that's being oxidized here and therefore is the worst reducing agent is chlorine. Remember all of these are written as if they're being reduced. So the chlorine is the uh, weakest reducing agent and simply you just got to put that that, that that electro potential is the most positive. So it has the most positive electro potential. Next question, when Hockel reacts as an oxidizing agent, one of the atoms in the molecule is reduced. Put a tick next to the atom that is reduced. So, um, when it's acted as an oxidizing agent, so your... So this will turn into Cl2 and some other stuff. Your Cl here is, my, is plus one, your Cl2 is zero. So that is being reduced and therefore is acting as an oxidizing agent. So chlorine... And then explain your answer. Well, you've got to explain it using oxidation states. So in 8 Hockel, Cl is plus 1. But in Cl2, Cl is 0. Using the information from table 3, deduce an equation for the redox reaction that would occur when hydroxide ions are added to Hockel. So that is 4... Oh, sorry. That is 4HOCl plus 4H plus... 
plus 4OH minus makes 2Cl2 plus O2 plus 6H2O. Now, actually, you could combine these to make four waters, which would then cancel with your six waters there. So you could not have these at all and have just two waters here, and that would also get you the mark. So they've repeated this table just to help you answer this question, so you have to keep looking back. It says the half equations from table 3 that involve zinc and oxygen are simplified versions of those that occur in the hearing aid cells. Um, and there's a diagram. It asks you to work out the EMF of the cell. Now it tells you that it's between zinc and oxygen. So you're looking at this one up here and your oxygen one here. So you're going to have minus one point, the difference between minus 1.25 and plus 0.4. So you've got minus 1.25 minus 0.4 to work out the difference, and that equals minus 1.65. Now, if you put plus 1.65, actually, you'd still get the mark there, so either plus or minus 1.65. Next question, use half equations in table 3 to construct an overall equation of the cell reaction. So your overall equation is going to be 2Zn plus O2 makes 2ZnO. And then identify which of A or B in figure 1 is the positive electrode and give a reason for your answer. And that's going to be A. And that's just because that the, the reason is the oxygen electrode potential is the most positive one or the more positive one. Or you could say the zinc electrode potential is the more negative one. So just referring to electrode potentials there. And suggest one reason other than cost why this type of cell is not recharged. And if cells aren't recharged, that's simply because the reaction can't be reversed. So that's your answer there. Reaction can't be reversed, or the reaction is irreversible. Next question says, hydrogen and oxygen fuel cells are used to provide electrical energy for electric motors and vehicles. In a hydrogen oxygen fuel cell, a current is generated that can be used to drive an electric motor. To use half equations of the electrode reactions in a hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. So your first one is your hydrogen being pumped on to your... Um, to your electrode, which will split up into 2H plus plus 2 electrons, and then those 2H pluses migrate across to react to the oxygen that's at the other electrode, and you'll also react to the two electrons that have also gone across but through the wires, and that will make your water, and you just need to have half O2 there. And use these half equations to explain how an electric current can be generated. So your two marks here for simply saying that your hydrogen electrode produces electrons and then your oxygen electrode accepts the electrons and the electrons move around a circuit to get from one place to the other. So first mark, the hydrogen electrode produces electrons and the second mark is the oxygen electrode accepts the electrons. Explain why a fuel cell does not need to be recharged. Simply, that's simply because the fuel is constantly fed in or the fuel is constantly supplied. And to provide energy for a vehicle, hydrogen can be used either in a fuel cell or in an internal combustion engine. Suggest so the main advantage of using hydrogen in a fuel cell rather than in an internal combustion engine. A few of you wrote about pollution here, but what it's asking is why is hydrogen used in this fuel cell rather than using hydrogen in the internal combustion engine. So it's not talking about petrol at all here. If I burnt hydrogen in the internal combustion engine, you still wouldn't produce any pollutants. So the reason here is it's more efficient. And then identify one major hazard associated with the use of a hydrogen oxygen fuel cell in a vehicle. And that you can just talk about the hydrogen. So H2 is flammable. Next question. The characteristic properties of transition metals include coloured ions, complex formation, and catalytic activity. Consider the chromium complexes P and Q. There's, there they are. It says, explain with reference to oxidation states and electron configurations why the chromium ions and complexes P and Q contain the same number of D electrons. You should not consider the electrons donated by the ligands. And then explain in terms of electrons why the complexes are different colours. The first thing is that both of these chromiums... are CR3+. Plus. And that's because, you can work that out, this one is 3+, plus, so all those waters are neutral, but this has a chloride ion on it, which donates a, like a 1 minus charge, the overall charge, so therefore chromium must be a 3+, plus charge. And the fact they're both 3+, plus and both, means that in, in both 
it is 3d3. So there's two marks already. So if the number of d electrons that are the same, then what's changing? Well, the ligands are different. So ligands are different is your next mark. And then that you need to be able to explain why the colours might be different. So they'll have a different energies of the d orbitals for your fourth mark. Therefore, the wavelength of light that is absorbed will be different for your fifth mark, which means the wavelength of light that will be reflected will be different for your sixth mark. So quite a lot of you were talking about how the colour is generated, but not why they're different. And so the way the question was asked means you wouldn't get marks for that. You have to talk about, you have to give your answer, but in the way the question wants you to. So ligand, so you've got one mark for this, one mark for this, one mark for saying the ligand's are different, then a mark for saying therefore the d orbital energies are different, so therefore the different wavelengths are absorbed, which means different wavelengths are reflected. Write an equation to show how uh, this a complex ion reacts with 1,2-diaminoethane and explain the thermodynamic reasons why this reaction occurs. So equation is simply CO... NH3, 6, 2 plus. That's going to react with three of these diaminoethanes, which uh, look like this. And the reason why it reacts with three of them is because it's um, sorry, bidentate, and that's going to make CO, and then you're going to have three of these attached to it. 2 plus, because they have no charge, and then plus 6 NH3s. So you get one mark for that. Then you get a mark for saying that, the, um, that there are four particles or entities on, this, on the left-hand side, but seven on the right-hand side, which means that's the mark. Then the third mark saying, therefore, disorder increases. And then you've got to say that delta H is around zero, because there's no real change in bond enthalpies. Um, you've still got the same, same bonds being formed. Uh, and that means that delta G is going to be less than zero. So first mark for the equation. Second mark, we're saying there's four entities on the left and seven entities on the right. Therefore, third mark, disorder increases. Delta H is around zero, and therefore delta G will be less than zero. Next question, the toxic complex cisplatin is um, an effective anti-cancer drug because it reacts with the DNA and cancer cells. Draw the displayed formula of cisplatin. So it's got platinum in the middle, and then you've got two NH3s on the same side, but you've got to draw the H's with all the bonds because it's a displayed formula. And then two CLs, there's no charge on it. Um, and you want a bond angle, so that one of the bond angles, it's 90 degrees. Now, if you don't draw a charge, then they assume you mean there's no charge. So it says state the charge, if any. So you get one mark for that drawing with the um, bonds being made, one mark for 90 degrees, then one mark for not actually drawing a charge at all. When cisplatin is ingested, an initial reaction involves one of the chloride ligands being replaced by water. Write an equation. So you're going to have PT, Cl, 2, NH3, 2, uh, plus water, and that's going to make PT, Cl, NH2, uh, NH3, sorry, 2, and that's going to now have a positive charge because you've got a Cl- minus coming off that's been, oh sorry, there's also water, ah, sorry, so you've got your Cl- minus coming off, and you've got PT, Cl, NH3, 2, H2O, and then that's got a 1 plus charge. I do apologise. And then it suggests how the risk associated with the use of this drug can be minimised, and that's just take in small doses. Because it's poisonous, you can't take too much, so it's just small doses that need to be used. And then explain with the aid of equations how and why vanadium oxide is used in the contact process. So first, equations. So you've got V2O5 plus uh, SO2 makes SO3 plus V2O4, then your V2O4 
reacts with half an O2 to make V2O5. So there's just the ones you have to re remember. Next marker is saying how it's used. So it's a catalyst. And therefore it speeds up the overall reaction. So quite straightforward marks there really. One for each of those. One for saying that it's acting as a catalyst. One for mark for saying that therefore it speeds up the overall reaction. Next question, which is a, a long moles question. You often get one of these in the Chem 5 paper, so you need to get used to how to, to, how to answer these. So a student carried an experiment to find the mass of iron sulfate in an impure sample. The student recorded the mass of X. The sample was dissolved in water and made up to 250 centimetres cubed of solution. The student found that after an excess of acid being acid, um, 25 centimetres cubed of this solution reacted with um, potassium chromate. So first thing is to write an equation. So always have to write some redox equations for these. So you've got the Cr2O7, 2 minus, and that will go to make Cr3 plus. So then just balance, you need two of those, you need seven waters, you need 14 H plus, and then you need six electrons. And then you've got your Fe2 uh, plus, so this iron sulfate is just Fe2 plus, uh, makes Fe3 plus, plus an electron, so you need six of those to balance. So your ratio is six to one. So then we need to work out moles. So do equation first, then follow through Mr. T. So first work out moles. So we can work out moles from these numbers here. So you've got moles of your uh, chromate, dichromate iron, sorry. That equals 21.3 times 0 0.0150 divided by 1,000. So that equals... 3.195 times 10 to the minus 4. Then, how many moles of iron 2 is in there? Well, moles of iron 2 plus will equal 6 to 1. So there's your ratio being used. So 3.195 times 10 to the minus 4 times 6, which equals, which equals 1.917 times 10 to the minus 3. And there's often a multiplication where you have to work out how much is in the conical flask to begin with in these sorts of questions. And there's this one's no different. So you have to work out the moles of iron 2 plus in 250 centimetres cubed, which is what it was originally dissolved in. And that equals 1.917 uh, times 10 to the minus 2. So timesing this one by 10. And then triangle... We're trying to work out mass. So that's going to equal your moles times your MR. So mass equals moles, 1.917 times 10 to the minus 2, times your MR of the iron sulfate, which is 277.9. And that equals 5.33 grams. And that's your final answer. Then final question says, the student found that the calculated mass of the iron sulfate was greater than the actual mass of the sample that had been weighed out. The student realised that this could be due to the nature of the impurity. It's just one property of an impurity that would cause the calculated mass of iron sulfate to be greater than the actual mass of X. And explain your answer. So the way you're going to have a calculated mass that is bigger is if your, tight, if your tighter value for the chromate is bigger. So if that works out bigger. So if you get a larger value for the tighter, then you'll get a bigger value for the mass. Now, why would you get a bigger value for the tighter? Well, that's if the impurity uh, reacts with the chromate ions as well. And that will make your tighter value bigger and therefore everything else will get will be bigger throughout the question that you've that you've done in the previous the previous question and so therefore your final mass will be bigger as well. If you have any questions about any of those questions then please email me and I will email you back.